Today I'm going to answer the question that I've been getting quite a bit, which is, which Arduino should I use in the project that I'm working on? And of course, people are working on a wide variety of projects, so I thought I'd show a selection of Arduinos here, and what their kind of capacities are. So we'll start with the Arduino Uno, which is pretty well the Ford of the Arduino series. This is what you'll find in a lot of high school robotics labs, and it's actually a great place to start. It's got solid connectors for USB, it's got 32K of flash, 2K of RAM, which means that you can run a fairly good program on it. It's got a nice selection of pins, about 13 digital, 6 analog, and so on and so forth. It's a good place to start. And its chief advantages would be that it's very standard, a lot of code out there is aimed at the UNO, and it has these shield rails so that you can click shields onto it and they can control motors, they can write to SD cards, and so on and so forth, so that um, you know that there's going to be a lot of standard code that will run for those shields without having to do a lot of finicky wiring. Now, Often, when people start to grow more advanced, they're doing more than just little line-following robots and whatnot, they realized they needed more of something. They needed more RAM, they needed more flash, they needed definitely more pins. Pins are usually a premium on a lot of things, so a lot of people go with the Arduino Mega. This thing, as you can see, has an amazing 53 digital pins. It has over a dozen analog pins, and it's still got the shield configuration, so a lot of shields that would click onto the Uno will also fit on here, and the code often will run without any fussing. And um, it's a good thing. It's got solid connectors. But where both of these start to break down, and this has, by the way, a lot of memory, it has 256K of flash, so huge programs can be stored there, and 8K of RAM, which means you don't have to be too fussy about um, monitoring your memory usage for most basic programs. So this is going to be used in a much more advanced robot, something with lots of sensors, something where you're actually controlling a lot of motors and whatnot. But now, while it seems like you have got a lot of pins, the reality is, is that if you were to try and power 53 bright LEDs, the current capacity of this is actually not there. So it would appear you can do that. It can't. And the reason for that is, well, as I say, you would burn this out. You would drain too much current and it wouldn't work. But you could control, say, 53 MOSFETs, because MOSFETs don't, the gates don't really take current. And so this could actually control 56 huge motors and it would be fine. But it's one of these things where it seems like it can do a lot, but you might end up having to use some kind of, like for instance with a lot of LEDs, you'd use some kind of LED controller or whatnot, which other smaller things are going to use, because you're only going to need one or two pins to control the LED controller. So, as I say, it's a good place to graduate to after learning on the UNO, and your projects start becoming more complex. But there's other places to go. And so now we'll go down, we'll go down scale a little bit. This is a Mini Pro. Um, they're sort of falling out of favor because their cost advantage is going away. And what you had was the same processors you find on the Uno, but it is a um, without a USB connector. So what that means is you have to find yourself a USB connector. They're not too expensive or hard to use. A little finicky to wire up, but you use this USB to serial, which then allows you to program this and, in theory, leave it in place. But they've fallen out of favor because they don't cost that much less than my personal favorite, which is the Nano. Again, same processor as the Mini and the Uno. So for basic robotics, for slightly more advanced controllers and whatnot, um, for most experiments, because a lot of times I like to break the projects I'm working on down into smaller and smaller bits, so each bit can easily run on a Nano. And they're cheap. It's got a USB. Great place. Now, the Teensy, I'm not going to talk about much. More powerful than the Nano, but not... Uh, they've fallen out of favor. They're a terrible price point for what they can do. Only time I'd recommend one would be if you need more power than the Nano can provide. That is, more computing power, but not much. Because, for just maybe double the price of a Nano, you can get this mouthful, which is an STM32F103C8, which is a very powerful thing. This, uh, the Nano, the Mini, the Uno, and the AT Mega are what are known as 8-bit processors, which means really when you're computing a lot of math, they're not very good at it. This guy here is a 32-bit processor. These other four 
here, they run at 16 megahertz. This is running at 17 megahertz. So when computing some difficult math, the difference of 72 megahertz computing 32 bits versus 16 computing 8 is that this can easily be 10 or more times faster when doing something hard. So if you've got some machine learning, say a neural network that's helping you do something with your robot or whatever, then this can handle it. Now, if you were to program, for instance, the flight controller of a drone, again, this has the math processing to do what's called the PID portion of balancing a, say, quadcopter, and the nano really doesn't. Maybe if you did some awesome assembly programming or something, you could squeeze it out of a nano, but this can do the computing, the horsepower you need for that kind of basic stuff. So. This is a huge step up, it's got a lot more RAM, it's got a lot more flash, and the 32 bits of computing power can make a big difference. Now, if you're just doing a pump controller or something, then this would be overkill. But, for instance, a good example of where this would be different than a Nano or an Uno or a Mini or a Mega, is if you were controlling, say, an OLED screen. So it's a little graphics, multicolor screen, maybe 200 pixels by 200 pixels. These other guys could only do about four frames per second, so it would be jerky, herky-jerky uh, screen resolution, or screen display. Whereas this guy might get you up to close to 30 frames a second, which means it'd be smooth, it'd be nice, I mean, it'd still be very primitive, but th that would be the difference. And this can also read from things that require that little extra bit of speed, so very, very sensitive, high-volume data throughputs can be sort of maybe within this guy's realm. Now, going off to a bit of a strange one, I've got one over here. This is not necessarily what you'd ever do as a beginner, but this guy's a ESP8266 MOD-based system with some extra little bits on it. And what this means is you can program this, it can talk over Wi-Fi, it's got a ton of pins, and this particular one, I'm running a web server on it, and the web server can control the pins. So you plug this in with some power, and it'll show up on my Wi-Fi network. I can go in with a web browser and actually control. And this guy here is an interesting upgrade. If you don't have enough compute power coming out of the rest of these boards, including the STM one, this guy's a good one because its data is Wi-Fi speed. So we're talking 56 megabit. So you could hook this up into, say, a robotic system where there's a lot of sensor data coming in, and you could feed that data to a desktop or a laptop, have it do the computing. So, of course, you've got now your i7 or whatever crazy processor, and it can go through the very huge data stream coming in, process it, and then send the signals back for this to control motors or whatnot. So this allows you to effectively extend outside of your robot to reach out to a very, very powerful thing. Because, of course, you don't necessarily want to have your laptop glommed onto your robot or your quadcopter or whatever. And as I said, this this guy could potentially also have the computing power to handle the PID that you'd need for a good quadcopter. So now we're looking at a little bit of some other esoteric ones. And these are quite useful, actually I find in the final project phase. This guy here is what's known as an AT Tiny 85. Um, you buy them by the 10-pack or 100-pack. They're very simple. They don't have a lot of RAM. They don't have a lot of flash. I think it's 8K of flash, 512 bytes of RAM. And so your programs have to be very small. This would be for like a little pump controller. Obviously, you don't have many pins. Um, they're a little bit weird to program. You actually have to connect them to an Uno to do the programming. And they um, they seem scary, but actually they're great for embedding in projects because they're cheap and then that way you're not leaving a big Arduino board and they use so little power it's crazy. They just these things can run on a little coin cell battery and you have to power them directly of course you're not running it through the nice USB port but you can give them anything from about 1.8 volts up to 5.5 volts and they're happy. They'll just run right along so very very useful um, to put into small projects but not much. You wouldn't put that into even a line following robot let alone something more advanced. But here, we've got sort of the big brother of the AT85, and this guy, AT Tiny 85, this guy is an AT Mega 328P, which is the same processor as you find in the Nano, 
the Mini, the Uno, and it might again seem scary. You have to connect it directly in, but when configured properly, they sip very little power and are equally powerful. So if you've programmed a robot with the Uno and it's doing what it wants to do and you want to make a final version of it, then rather than dedicating your Uno to it, you could throw one of these in. They're actually not that hard to program. You just connect a um, USB to serial programmer and I've got an example of both an AT Tiny setup and an AT Mega. 328p setup. So we'll just power up the AT Tiny. I've got it with a variation of the Blink program, sort of a what I would call a staggered Blink. I programmed it through an Uno, and we'll just connect this with the rail, and there we go. Oops, it's unplugging itself. I need better wires for this. So it's doing a staggered Blink, and very simple. As you can see, it's just a couple of power wires running in. I've got this connected to a battery that's a lithium battery. It's putting out about just under 4 volts. And as you can see, it's happy. It's powering the LED. It's running well. And, um, but you can't do, I mean, you can do more than blinking a light, but not a whole lot. You can do some basic motor control or something like that. And now we'll program, or we'll power up this AT Mega. Again, I'm only running a blink program, but this is equally it has the equal capacity to the Uno. And again, very simple to wire up. Now I want to run this at 16 megahertz, although if I were running at 8, I could get rid of some of the circuitry. And this is a little crystal oscillator, a couple of capacitors that work with the crystal. This capacitor is only needed when you're programming it. And then a little pull-up resistor. And that's it. It's um, Otherwise there's pins, and we can look at a pin configuration here. And as you can see, just each of these pins has a, um, so this is what digital pin it is. So here's pins 13 through 9, and then here's digital pins 1 through 6, 9 through 14, and there's, you can have your analog pins up here. It's actually not that complicated, it's just that it's not neatly labeled like you would find with the UNO or anything like that. So once you've graduated from the UNO, this is equally uh, capacious, if you want to say, for what it can do, but um, it is uh, very, very low energy. Because when you're looking at an UNO board, for instance, the all the extra circuits on an UNO board are actually using up power. There's a voltage regulator on there, and it's just you sipping away at some of the power, and so on and so forth. So you can't power in a very, very low power project. You don't want to be using a whole board when you could just be using one of these tiny little um, processors. But it's equally capable, and you save some money by buying these processors um, this way. They're quite a bit cheaper, and maybe half the price of a Nano to buy just the raw chip. Plus, it's smaller. So when you're putting it into a project, assuming you're putting it into something that... Um, you want to save every bit of space as well as the energy, then it's definitely better to have one of these chips than it would be to have this big um, Nano, or definitely an Uno or a Mega. Anyway, so if you are working on these different types of projects, there's a variety of um, Arduinos for your various needs, and often there'll be just maybe one feature you were looking for that you needed something a bit more uh, more timers, for instance, the AT Tiny. I think it only has one timer, timer, maybe two. And there's more timers available on the Nano. Even more timers available on the Mega. And then um, so on and so forth. So it's a it's a situation where maybe there's one feature you need that's more, or maybe you just need all kinds of features. So this guy here, for instance, is very capable in just about every aspect. So he's a great place to end. I would say he's about as big processor or this guy that you're ever going to use before graduating to Raspberry Pi. I guess that would be the one ex sort of next step. I should say that. The, um, I definitely have used that in robotics before, where the Raspberry is being hauled around and they're very energy efficient. So, And they definitely have more capacity than anybody here. So, um, And the new Pis look actually pretty cool. New Pi 3. 
Anyway, if you have any questions, feel free to ask, um, subscribe, and vote this up, and all those things. That really helps. And um, thank you very much for watching. I hope you have great success with your Arduino games.